Well, just when you thought you've seen it all, on these hair loss forms and subreddit from somebody drinking topical minoxidil, which by the way, don't do that because it could possibly kill you, to now someone going ahead and doing something strange but admittedly new. I saw a post some days ago from a user on Reddit's Tressless Community, a subreddit dedicated to discussing hair loss and potential treatments and solutions. Anyway, someone decided to make their own PRP, Yes, you heard that right, a do-it-yourself platelet-rich plasma injection protocol. Now, for those of you who don't know what PRP is, allow me to explain. PRP, or platelet-rich plasma, is a medical procedure primarily used to treat various conditions, including hair loss. The procedure involves drawing a small amount of a patient's own blood, processing it to concentrate the platelets, and then re-injecting it into the patient's body specifically into the areas of concern. So sometimes PRP injections are used to treat specific injuries like a meniscus tear or joint issues. But now it's also being used for androgenetic alopecia and other hair loss conditions and disorders. The theory behind PRP for hair loss is that the concentrated platelets, which are rich in growth factors, can stimulate hair follicles, thereby promoting hair growth. These growth factors can potentially increase the blood supply to the hair follicle and thereby trigger hair growth, increase the thickness of the hair shaft, and also decrease the rate of hair loss. And again, depending on your hair loss condition, whether it's androgenetic alopecia or alopecia areata or even just telogen effluvium, PRP will have varying success rates. The PRP procedure is usually done in a clinical setting by trained professionals, not some guy on Reddit or some dude in your local gas station bathroom. The procedure is generally as followed. The first step involves drawing a small quantity of blood from the patient, similar to what one would experience during a routine blood test. Second, the blood is processed in a centrifuge. This machine, by virtue of its high speed spinning action, segregates the blood into its constituent components. Step three is the post-centrifusion. One can observe the blood partitioned into three distinct layers. Red blood cells settled at the bottom, platelet-poor plasma floats on the top, and the coveted PRP nestles in between both of these layers. This PRP is then carefully extracted using a syringe. The final step is the reinjection of this PRP into areas of the scalp that are displaying signs of hair loss. However, it's imperative to mention that while there are numerous anecdotal accounts of PRP's efficacy, its effectiveness in treating hair loss varies among individuals. Moreover, the scientific community is still in the process of gathering conclusive evidence regarding its success rate. There's this nice literature review that I will leave in the description that looks at the various studies that relate to androgenetic alopecia and PRP treatment. This particular review is titled, quote, Platelet-Rich Plasma for Androgenetic Alopecia, a Review of the Literature and Proposed Treatment Protocol, unquote, by J. Stevens and S. Catarpo. Essentially, the review looks at how PRP therapy can potentially foster hair growth due to growth factors that exist in the blood plasma. These growth factors include PDGF, TGF-beta, VEGF, EGF, and IGF-1, which all plays a role in promoting cell growth, enhancing angiogenesis, which is the creation of new blood vessels, and also mitigating cell death. In fact, when DHT is miniaturizing the hair follicles in patients with androgenetic alopecia, IGF-1 levels reduce, which cause hair follicle stem cells to decrease in number and activity. Through these actions, PRP is theorized to amplify the blood supply and growth factors to hair follicles and extend the hair growth phase. This, in theory, quickly progresses the transition of dormant hair follicles going into their active growth phase. There are various classification systems for PRP, which are differentiated by the presence of components such as leukocytes and fibrin. Leukocytes, or white blood cells, 
immune cells that play an essential role in fighting infections and mitigating inflammatory reactions. They can be further subdivided into various types, including neutrophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, and there are some pros to having these included in PRP. Particularly, leukocytes can help battle infections. Thus, PRP preparations with higher leukocytes concentrations might be beneficial in situations where there's a risk for infection. However, there is a con. Some leukocytes, particularly neutrophils, can release enzymes and reactive oxygen species that might exasperate inflammation or potentially damage tissues. As a result, there's a debate about whether the presence of leukocytes in PRP preparations might sometimes be more harmful than beneficial, especially in situations where inflammation needs to be minimized. Now, fibrin, on the other hand, is a protein involved in the clotting of blood. It's formed from fibrinogen, a soluble protein, with the help of the enzyme thrombin. Fibrin strands assemble into a mesh-like structure that, together with platelets, forms a clot to prevent excessive bleeding. And the importance in PRP when it comes to fibrin-rich PRP is that this can be beneficial for certain applications where a more solid or gel-like scaffold is needed. Because fibrin-rich PRP has like this sort of gel-like consistency, primarily due to that fibrin like I mentioned before. So this would probably be useful if you have let's say something like an FUT procedure where they actually have to cut out a large section of your scalp. So a fibrin-like matrix can serve as a scaffold that holds the platelets in place and provides a slow and steady release of their growth factors over time, which can actually help heal deep tissue traumas, like you would see with the follicular unit transplantation or FUT hair transplant procedure. But again, depending on the clinical situation and desired outcome, PRP can be prepared with varying concentrations of leukocytes and fibrin. One of the noteworthy classification systems is the DEPA classification introduced in 2016. This system classifies PRP based on parameters like dose, efficiency, purity, and the activation process. One of the major downsides when it comes to PRP preparations is that there isn't a standardized method. So different physicians have different ways of producing PRP treatments. Some practitioners of PRP use certain enzymes and proteins to enhance PRP treatment. I think there's this one particular sort of PRP-esque kind of treatment called Trichostem, which is conducted by Dr. Amiya Prasad at his own clinic, Prasad Cosmetic Surgery. And to my understanding, he actually invented Trichostem. So again, because of this lack of standardization, it's kind of hard to see what is efficacious about PRP if it's just those specific blood growth factors alone, or if it's something else that these researchers are putting into the PRP that enhances hair follicles and their regrowth rates. But again, there is an unfortunate lack of uniformity in treatment protocols, including the frequency and duration of treatments across different studies. So it is really hard to say at the end of the day whether or not PRP would make a huge difference for people who have androgenetic alopecia. And if you're living in the United States where PRP could be anywhere between $1,000 to $3,000, and if you have a physician who says, hey, you have to come in every month to do your PRP treatment, or even some of my subscribers have told me they do weekly PRP treatments, it can be very costly for something that may have little to no results. So in terms of that expectation that you're having for all that money you're putting in, Unless you're like a, you know, a rich guy, multi-millionaire, we, we all wish to be that one day, right? <laughs> Unless you're that kind of guy, you'll have your expectations set pretty high. So I think if you're going for PRP treatment, don't expect to get any sort of crazy improvement in your hair loss recovery. Now, going back to the Reddit guy who thought it would be a good idea to do this do-it-yourself PRP treatment, I understand how pricey PRP can be. In fact, in his little description, on Reddit, he does say something to the effect of, haha, it sucks for you guys, have fun paying $2,000, I'm doing this myself. So yeah, we understand how pricey PRP can be, especially here in the United States, but a do-it-yourself PRP raises several red flags for me. Number one is the sterility and how paramount it is in any medical procedure. In clinical settings, Stringent measures are taken to ensure equipment sterilization, thus minimizing the possibility of infections. And attempting PRP at home 
can compromise the sanitation standards, elevating the potential for contamination. Also, the machinery such as the centrifuges, crucial for PRP, is not only specialized, but also carries a hefty price tag in some cases. Now, from my understanding, this particular Reddit user, I think one on Amazon or eBay, and they were able to find a sort of makeshift apparatus or a secondhand centrifuge, but you don't really want to cheap out on this particular quality. Because if you don't have a good centrifuge that can actually spin at an adequate rotation and speed, you're not going to get that good separation of the different blood layers. So between your platelet-poor plasma, your platelet-rich plasma, and your just regular red blood cells. And also, I think we underappreciate the significant level of expertise required to draw blood, process it, and then re-inject it. When placed in untrained hands, there is a palpable risk for injuries or misapplications. Now, looking at this Reddit user's comments on his own do-it-yourself PRP post, this user mentions that they use their do-it-yourself PRP treatment not as an injection, but they're applying it topically before they microneedle. That seems kind of weird. Now, I'm not sure what they're thinking if somehow the PRP would bolster the damage and healing from the microneedling and thus increasing hair growth, I think that might be their rationale. But this doesn't seem to be wise, because typically PRP is injected into the scalp and to a deeper level of the skin, like the epidermis or dermis. Also, from looking at the picture, I find something concerning. And maybe it's just me, but when I look at his syringe, I see a lot of bubbles in there. This is dangerous whether you're drawing blood or injecting the blood back into your body, as it could create an air bubble that travels to your heart and, well, you know, you kind of, you know, it's game over for you. Hopefully nothing bad happens, but in many cases when that happens, you put your life at risk. So PRP's effectiveness hinges on precise concentration. Without the requisite knowledge and controls, a do-it-yourself approach provides no assurance of yielding the desired outcomes. So I might have to give this guy a goofy head ass award for his do-it-yourself PRP antics. Now, the drive and ingenuity of certain individuals in their quest to combat androgenetic alopecia is indeed admirable, but the overarching principle should always be safety and efficacy. Hence, before venturing into experimental treatments, particularly those that are invasive, seeking counsel from a medical expert is of utmost importance. Or just post it on Reddit and see what the internet doctors have to say about that. Okay, obviously I'm joking there and I hate to even have to say that, but I kind of have to. But anyway, thanks for watching this video and if you want a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me, check my links in the description below. Anyway, I hope to see you guys in the next video. Peace out.